Welcome to episode four of the Magpie Circle podcast and we're joined today by another one of our great alumni who played for us in the top flight and he played in fact in three of the four divisions. Big welcome to Paul Devlin. Hiya. Hey, good to see you Paul. Um, now it's interesting because clearly we're licking our wounds a little bit having missed out on the chance to get back into the football league so much as it pains us to say it, we're, 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 we're classed as a non-league club now. Um, you've kind of went in the opposite direction uh, with Notts County as a springboard from, from non-league to uh, the Football League and top flight. And it's not very often we can say this, but we managed to sign you uh, when Liverpool couldn't, which all sounds <laughs> rather perverse, but let's just wind the clock back to your days at Stafford and, and how you didn't end up at Liverpool, but did end up at Notts County. Yeah, I sort of, I, I kind of football... Um... Late in life, really. I didn't really start taking it seriously until I was about 17. Sort of drifted back into non-league and Sunday footballs and sort of climbed my way through the non-league pyramid until eventually, I think it was 91, signing for Stafford Rangers for, for £2,000 from a team called Armitage 90. Um, and we played Liverpool after not long after Graham Sooners had taken over in a friendly at Marston Road. Did quite well. We lost the game 2-0 or 2-1, I can't remember. Uh, and after the game, uh, the manager came up to me and says, you know, Graham Sooners was, was impressed today. He'd like you to go up on trial, you know, for, for a week. So I went up there for a week, played in a reserve game against Sheffield Wednesday at Anfield. They asked me back. And this, you know, this was going on for about five or six weeks. I played another reserve game uh, away at West Brom. And, and it just coincided with Ian Rush had been out for a long time with an Achilles injury. Uh, and it was Ian Rush's comeback game, and I played up front with Ian Rush. There was about 8,000 at Albion to watch this reserve game, and uh, I managed to score the goal, and we won 1-0. Um, Phil Thompson was, was reserve team manager at the time. You know, buzzing after, I'm thinking, well, I've done enough to, to get myself a little move here, but it, it, it all broke down, and, uh, you know, as time come to pass, I, I, I heard the story that because we'd sold Stan Collymore um, that season or the season before to to Crystal Palace for £100,000, which was then a record for a non-league teenager, that Stafford wanted too much money for me. You know, I think Liverpool were prepared to pay you know, 10, 20 grand, something like that. And I think Stafford were asking way over and above that. And, uh, and it all sort of broke down. And then I think, I think the fee that I ended up going to Notts County for in the end after Adams and everything was about, was about 80 odd grand, 85 grand. So yeah, it's uh, Notts, Notts County got me where, where Liverpool couldn't. Hey, so hey, this is an un even more unlikely story. So Derek Pavis's checkbook, he raided his checkbook more than the Liverpool owner was prepared to pay for you. Eh? Well, that's a bit of a surprise, isn't it? Well, let me tell you, that, <laughs> that didn't happen very often. That, I, I can still, you know, I can, I've still got my, my first knots contract today and I can remember sitting in, he had a plumber's merchants, I think, Mr Pavis, and I remember, remember sitting in his plumber's merchants and I can tell you what it was for this day, three years. It was £325 a week, 350 and 375 and 12 grand signing on fee over three years, so four grand a year signing on fee. And that was me signing in the first division, the top flight at the time. But, you know, it was great. I had four great years there, and it, it was fantastic to get my foot on the ladder and always be grateful to the club for giving me my chance. Now, a, a great friend of Notts County, Howard Wilkinson. Um, clearly a serial success story. Um, but it was kind of, um, I think Howard gave you a bit of a rollicking for joining us, didn't he? Yeah, once I come back from Liverpool, because um, I was I was sort of the hot thing in non-league at that time after after Stan had gone to Palace, uh, he rang me up um, again. It, it was crazy. I'm, I was living at home at the time. The phone the phone's gone one Monday morning, and hello, it's Howard Wilkinson, and I'm like, yeah, of course it is. It's one of the lads out <laughs> messing around. And then obviously Neil Neil Warnock rang me sort of half hour after, and I said, well, I'd, I'd promised I'd go up to Leeds, so I went up to Leeds for the week. It was the middle of winter, you know, I was in digs right next to Ellen, Ellen Road, played a reserve game, did well, but didn't really, didn't really get, the, get the feel for the place. And, you know, obviously I came and had a trial at Nuts and uh, really liked Neil, really liked, really liked the town, players were great. Went back to Leeds again because I promised to go back up there and then came back, made my mind up and signed for Nuts County when I came back. And then on the Monday after I'd signed, uh, phone's gone again, and it was it was Howard Wilkinson, and he gave me a gave me a right rollicking for signing for Nuts for Nuts County. But he never really let on how he felt about me as a player. You know, he was that sort of deadpan and and serious all the time. I didn't know whether he rated me, whether he did, whether he didn't. He obviously did because you know he he told me that he, he wanted to sign me, 
and uh, that year we got relegated out the top flight and they won the league. So it was <laughs> probably a little bit of bad judgment on my behalf. But, you know, I, I can't complain. I came and I played, you know, 100 and something game for not. So I might have gone to, a, you know, with Liverpool or Leeds and I might never have played a first team game. So no regrets. It was a great grounding for me. So when you came to Notts, um, top flight, bit of a struggle that season. Um, clearly, Neil was a very um, charismatic manager. Think on your debut, uh, we won, beat Coventry 1-0, uh, one of the rare wins that season, yeah? Yeah, well, I mean, I made my debut against Coventry, so I'd gone from within sort of a couple of, couple of weeks or months playing Sunday League football to then playing, it, playing against, at that time, England's most capped fullback in the top division of professional football. They had Kenny Sampson playing for him. So I never had a kick. Never, yeah, he never gave me a kick, in all honesty. But I was involved in a couple of games, I think two out the last three or four games. And we, and we won them both, funnily enough. We, we beat Luton. I came on a sub and we beat Coventry. So I had, uh, I had uh, nearly enough 100% record in the top flight for Nuts. But it, it, it was unfortunate we got, we got relegated that season along with Luton and... I can't remember. I can't remember who the other one was, but you know it was great going from playing Sunday morning parks football to making my debut in the top flight in a in a matter of weeks, really. I mean that's an incredible, incredible rise by anybody, any one stretch. Um, Neil was the sort of manager that was never afraid to plunge players in. There was, you know, Tommy Johnson and Mark Draper a couple of yeah. years earlier had gone in at literally just turned seventeen. Um, what was Neil like to play for? Brilliant. I really liked him. You know, I had two spells under Neil, obviously one at Knotts where he took me from non-league and, and you know, a couple of years at Sheffield United. He'd calmed down a lot at Sheffield, <laughs> let me tell you. I mean, uh, vol volatile wasn't the word when he was at Knotts. But no, I mean, I remember uh, when he signed me. He, at that time, he used to get so many points for a booking and so many for a sending off. And he didn't realise how many points I had, how many times I'd been booked. I think I, I think I only had one booking for Knotts and I was suspended for about three weeks and it and it came to pass that I'd got the record ever points accumulation for that time of the season for, for bookings and sendings off. But he quite liked that, that side of my game, Neil. You know, he, he liked the fiery side and, you know, a bit of the small man syndrome and a bit of an aggression. So he liked that. And I just remember, you know, what a real eye opener for me was on, on Thursdays when we used to train at, at Boots. I'd say, right, lads, studs and boots on. And you think, what's studs and boots on a Thursday? And he played eight and nine a side on a five a side pitch. Anyone that pulled out a tackle wasn't involved on Saturday. So you'd have us basically kicking lumps out of each other on a, on a Thursday morning to, for a game Saturday. But yeah, he had his own way of doing things now. But I think, I think you look now, he's, he's at the latter end of his career and you look at the record he's had and he's had, you know, he's had an amazing career. Now. Everywhere he's been there enough. Um, Neil, unfortunately, wasn't there um, too long uh, because yep. he, he he was uh, he was sacked basically, uh, wasn't he? Two or three months into in, into yeah. the following season, um, what was it like for you then? Having just played Sunday football, you got into the top flight. Knots have been relegated. You've, I guess, I guess the phrase is, um, you're not a shrinking violet on the pitch. Yeah. Did, did did you kind of just take into into the pro ranks? You know, your aggression, you didn't feel intimidated by anyone, you weren't phased by playing these big names. You got stuck in, didn't you? Yeah, I think um, that was all, you know, I was predominantly a right winger throughout my career, although I played down the middle. And, you know, wingers do get this reputation of being a bit sort of airy fairy, not liking the physical side of the game. But it was always a part of the game that I, that I really enjoyed. Um, I think, obviously, because I am, I am only four foot eight. Uh, I sort of thought to myself, well, I've got to compensate for, you know, not being six foot two, but being a, a little bit more aggressive, you know, and the vast majority of my, my early career has probably overstepped the mark more, more than I should have. But I always liked that side of the game, you know, it was it was one of them. And when, when I first started playing, full-backs and centre-halves were allowed. The first tackle was like a freebie for them anyway. So they'd kick lumps out of you. So I always thought, well, I'm, I'm not just going to stand and take this. You're going to get you're going to get a few lumps kicked back. So it was always, always part of the game I enjoyed, to be honest. Mick Walker uh, took yeah. over um, and Drapes playing down the middle, some younger yeah. players, went pretty close to going up uh, under Mick. Yeah, I mean, Mick was fantastic. Brilliant fellow, Mick. You know, I can't, can't speak highly enough of him. Fantastic coach. Him, him along with Russell Slade did a, did a great job that season. Obviously, Mick had a lot of experience with, with the younger players at the club and, uh, and, and that season, 
I think we had a really, really good chance. We had a good team, you know, with the, with the likes of obviously Lundy, Drapes, Jono, Phil Turner, Lego, myself, uh, people like that, you know. And when we just missed out. And the, the game that always sticks out in my mind is when Dyke scored the own goal at the baseball ground. I think it was, did, did we either draw the game or lose it in the last minute? And I, I think without that own goal, I remember it now, chasing a, a ball and he's, he's headed it over Steve Cherry. And I think without that goal, we, we would have made we would have made the playoffs. I think that season, and then unfortunately we just missed out on the playoffs that season. And then the team got you know within twelve months. I think Mick had gone, Drapes had gone, John O had gone, I'd gone, Leg had gone. You know the the, t the team was broken apart. But we were we were so close that season to getting in the playoffs, and we had a really good Gary McSweeg and one of the, one of the best finishers I ever played with. We had a real good attacking fast-flowing team with a mixture of youth and experience, you know, and, and an exciting team to watch. But for our younger listeners and viewers, I mean, I, I always remember, because I just started at Leicester um, that season, uh, so I was I was the communications manager, press officer, as it then was, um, and we came with Leicester to, uh, to the game uh, at Meadow Lane, and Notts won 4-1. I don't know if you remember it, absolutely battered Leicester. Brian Little was, yeah. was, was mortified. Uh, and I think I'm right in saying, hey, in later on, you'd have probably joined in, but wasn't that when part of the ground was officially opened and Derek's gone on the pitch at half time? You'd have been <laughs> in the day. He's gone on the pitch at half time to make this lovely speech about how he's transformed the stadium and the ground and all the rest of it. And there's 4,000 Leicester fans in, the, in, the, in that cop end, and they've all started abusing him in this chant. And he's just <laughs> turned around and gone, You bastards. And he had to realise the mic was still on. So yeah. then he had to apologise. Uh, to 4,000 uh, Leicester fans. But I remember that game, Drapes was, Drapes was quality that day. I think yeah. Gary Mack would have scored 4-1. Yeah. For our younger viewers, I mean, that's Leicester who won the Premier League three years ago and you, and you beat them 4-1? Yeah, well, we, you know, we, we took apart some really good teams. You know, I remember us beating Derby four there as well when Derby was spending big money. Famous game in the, in the Cup where we beat Spurs and, you know, yeah. knock, knock them out 3-0. No, we are, a lot of the younger younger people watching this won't remember how good a team we had in those days. The Spurs games, you've reminded me, it was a night game because I, yes. I was sat with Drapes watching it because Drapes had signed for Leicester. That's and right, yeah. that was the game, I think, Ardiles got, Ozzy Ardiles was the manager. Didn't he get the sack the following morning? Yeah, he, he, got, he got the sack after that game because they, they, you know, they had some really, really big, you know, Popescu, I'm not sure whether Klinsman was there. I think Klinsman was playing. But, you know, I think Nick Barnby, they, they had a really, really, you know, world famous players in their team. And, and we battered them on a, on a, I don't know, it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday yeah. night at Medellin. I think, I think Swedes got two and Tony Agana scored one or, or the other way around. But, yeah, we, we absolutely hammered them. And, and you're right, you got the sack the next day, I believe. What was it like in the dressing room at Knotts? Well, at first, when I first saw him, because I wasn't a first team player, everyone was terrified to go in the dressing room. So, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't go in the first team dressing room unless either the gaffer had asked you to do something or, or one, of the, one of the older players had, uh, had asked you, you know. But it, it could be a really volatile place. Let me tell you, there was, uh, there, there was, there, there was nothing held back if, if people thought that you'd done wrong or, or they wanted to tell you something. It's not like today where you tread on eggshells. You, you, you were told in no uncertain terms. We had some great older pros in, in those early days in Don O'Reard and Charlie Palmer, Phil Turner. Steve Cherry, people like that, but uh, it was no good being a shrinking violet in that in that dressing room. Let me tell you, hey, who were the ones that scared you the most when you were a young lad first going in? Oh well, obviously Neil. Neil was was that lad, <laughs> the gaffer. Paul Hardy was was hard as nails. Paul Hardy was, was as tough as the come. Yeah, I mean, uh, so Charlie, Charlie, great, great fella, but you know, you if Charlie spoke, you listened. And like I say, Don O'Reid and Phil Turner, Chess. A lot of players with a lot of experience, Gary Lund, uh, that, that you'd listen to that could that could give you a rollicking, but that also could also help you as much as they can as well. Now, Michael Johnson became a good friend, uh, of yeah. yours, and still is. Um, now, he told a story in one of our previous podcasts that you were definitely the person to make sure you were on the same side in the five sides, yeah? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But well, I mean, uh, John, John, our lifelong friend, we've been, we've been friends 30 years and you know, we'll be, we'll be pals to the day. We all played at Nuts together, played at Blues together. Still see each other now and again. But yeah, I mean, I used to, uh, like I say, I used to get pretty pretty heated at times and, and that would apply in training as well. 
Whereas John, I was quite easy going and laid back in training. I always tried to train the way I played. And if some, if I felt I was done wrong in training, then it, it could be John. Oh, it could be they were get they were getting it. They were getting kicked back. Or uh, if I felt that Mick Walker or Neil Warner can not give a foul against me, I thought it was foul. You know, I'd uh, I'd get wound up. So yeah, there were. Possibly overstepped the mark a few times with my own teammates in training as well. So were you almost Roy Keane esque then on the training ground? Um, I don't know. I, mean, I don't know about Roy Keane esque, but I just I, I didn't like losing. I didn't like losing whether it was a, a five side in training or whether it was a shooting competition. Um, so yeah, just 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 that just that world to win really, and obviously that little bit of. Uh, that little bit of aggression. I just I couldn't switch it off in training. All oh, right, I'm going to be laid back. I'm not going to boot anyone. I'm going to take it easily, and then switch it on on a Saturday. I had to have it on tap in training and on a Saturday as well. You had two very big cup runs while you were there that ended yeah. with two game two games at Wembley. Anglo Italian. Now, what were they like? Oh, brilliant! You know, it, it was a much maligned cup at the time because the crowds weren't great mm -hmm. and. There was a load of sendings off in Italy because we had English refs in Italy and Italian refs in England. So, but you know the, the the way I look at it, you know, I got I got two trips to Wembley out of that, and I played against. I still say to this day, uh, you know, having played international football and Premier League football, that uh, Hadji at Wembley uh, for Brescia, that the first year we got there that we lost one of the best players that I ever I ever shared a football pitch with, and, and we, we were fortunate the next year to get back again against Ascoli, who had. You know, Oliver Bierhoff, World Cup winner uh, in their team to, to beat them. I, I think when it, it came back in its guys, we were the only English team to win it, if I remember rightly. So it was brilliant, yeah, really fun memories. Took two trips to Wembley. Had you been to Wembley before to play? Was that your first time at Wembley? I'd been to Wembley to watch, it was a school trip once, for uh, to watch an England schoolboy international. And I don't know why my dad let me go on that, because my dad's from Glasgow, so he wouldn't have wanted me to go and watch England. So my mum must have got me on that trip under the radar. But that was the only time I'd been before. So to get the chance to go there and, and play two years in a row was, was unbelievable. What, what, what was quality about Hadji? I just, very similar to Skulls, really. You know, small in stature, very stocky, but one of a left foot, just controlled the game. Every other player... Just hung on every word he said. I don't remember him giving the ball away. He could pass it five yards as well as 85 yards. Just just really good playing. He, you know, this presence around him. You could tell that he was a world, world-class player. Uh, that every other player in that team, that, that just hung on every word he said. I think Jono tells a story. I'm not sure which final it was, but I think on one of them, uh, the opposition turned up in what three-piece suits, looked the part, all the Italian designer shades, and 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 you turned up in your own gear or something, or all, all of you collectively. Uh, I remember, uh, yeah, I can't remember which way round it was, but they turned up, and I think they'd been sponsored by Armani. You know, they, they look, they all look like, and they're all got Italian long, dark, curly hair. All look like male models, and we're there in these match-winner shell suits and that. Bear in mind, when we had the shell suits given out, it wasn't a case of, I'll have a medium, I'll have a 42. It was like, have one that fits Devon White. So I've, I've got this shell suit, I look like Coco the Clown in it. And it was one size fits all. I mean, the amount of times that I see an old picture on the pitch and people say, but what size top was you wearing there? And I said, well, I played with Devon White at Notts County and Kevin Francis at Blues. So the tops had to fit both. One was six foot seven, one was six foot five. So you know, a short sleeve on, on one of me was, was down to there. So it wasn't the days was, yeah, I'll have a, I'll have a medium fit when it was like one size fits all. So you get, you get what you're given. You set the goal up for Devon, didn't you? The winner against Ascoli. Yeah, but I've gone down and crossed it in. I mean, to be fair, it was a brilliant header. Brilliant header by Devon. Dev was a great lad. And, you know, the, the size of him, you, you'd expect him to be good in the air. But it was actually quite a looping cross. And he's, he's got to get up and he's got to generate power himself. So yeah, it was a, you know he, he took it well, and then I remember the second goal. Andy Legg, my old pal as well. You know, still lifelong friends with Legg. He still speaks to Legg. He's still to this day the best throwing that I've ever yeah. seen. You know, he used to throw it flat like a missile. He's throw it in, and I think Tony claimed that he got a touch on it. But <laughs> I'm still, I still query to this day whether Leggy threw that straight in and, and nobody touched it. Of course, if that had been the case, couldn't have counted, could it? So I don't no. suppose people are going to argue too much with Tony claiming it. No, 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 no. You know, as, as long as we got the goal, we, we weren't bothered. They, they were the cups. Um, now, we, we always like some funny stories, banter. Um, so 
what's the story that Jono's alluded to? Because you, you, I don't know whether you still do. You, 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 yeah. you like snakes. You keep snakes, yeah. Yeah, I've had a few down the years. I haven't got one at the moment. Four, four kids and a barmy dog's enough at the minute. So yeah, I've had about five or six snakes down the years. But but you had an unusual name for one of your snakes, didn't you? Yeah, I was out of contract, <laughs> and I was sort of um, in in. Uh, I think a polite way to put it is negotiations with with, with Mr. Pavis. And it got a bit heated, uh, to say the least, on a couple of occasions. I mean, he was an intimidating man, Derek, but, you know, I was, still think really fondly of him. And so uh, I thought I'd name my snake Derek. And uh, it got out. I think David Stapleton was the um, the reporter mm -hmm. for The Post at the time. And they actually printed it. And he, he, was, he wasn't happy. He wasn't happy, Mr. Baby. So he let me know he wasn't happy. But in later times, I went back and had a bit of a laugh about it. So... I think he did take it as a bit of an insult that I'd named the snake after him. But it was it was banter on my behalf. It wasn't something that, I, you know, he just thought, oh, this, this will wind him up. But yeah, he, he found out about it and he let me know it wasn't happening. What, what type of snake was it then? Just a corn snake. Just a yeah. corn snake. Nothing, nothing mad. Just, yeah, you know, four foot corn snake. But I thought it would be funny. But um, I think it might have cost me a few bob down the line as well in fine. So it was probably, probably the most expensive snake I had. You, you, you cop for a few fines you've mentioned there, yellows and reds. I mean, yeah. do you remember all of them? Or, or, or I mean, you, you were always borderline, I think it was fair to say. Oh, God, I can't remember them all. I just, like I say, I just remember that when I signed, I only had one booking for nuts and I was suspended. And Neil Warnock didn't realise I'd accumulated all these points in the season leading up. But no, it seemed like a, in the early part of my career, it seemed like it was a yellow card every game or every other game. And, I don't know how many times I got red carded down the years. It'd probably be eight to ten, which is, which is far too many. But yeah, you know, I, try, I did try and curb it later on in the career. And I think if you look over, I played the best part of 15 years. And the vast majority of that side of it was, was sort of the first, first seven or eight years until I, I got clever enough to realise that <laughs> it's hurting you in the pocket, all these fines and that. So I did try, I did try and calm it down. What can you remember about the dressing room? Who, 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 who were the jokers? Who were the influencers on you? Um, well, like I say, I mean, everyone looked up to Charlie and, and Dan O'Riordan and Steve Cherry, Phil Turner, people like that. Gary Lund was, was brilliant. Very, very quiet fella, uh, but real good professional, good pro. Obviously, you know, I lived in a house with, with John Owen Leggy. Uh, we had you? a house now. Okay. Yeah, me, me John Owen Leggy. Leggy's a little bit older than us, so he was the first one to get a house, so I don't think he intended on us having us roommates, but yeah, I mean, that Where was, was that? Our, that was that. Hey? Where was that? Where was the down house? By the down by the race course. Oh, down yeah, there. Colic, yeah. Yeah, yeah down, down there, down there. So uh, we all used to socialise together, you know, it was, it was Ritzy on a Wednesday, it was Black Orchid <laughs> on a Saturday, uh, and a bit of training and football in between. So that was our, that was our three. We, we, we probably shared that house for, for two or three years, and it was, it was just amazing that obviously John and I went to Blues, and then me and Leggy both ended up signing for Blues as well. So it was, it, it was you know, scary, really, how it all, all happened. But it was a real good dressing room. You know, Gary McSwig and good... You know, I, I probably couldn't name you one that I thought, well, I didn't really get on with him. Everyone got on, like I say. Mind Dirk Dykstra, still speak to him regular. Bob Catlin, still speak to them on Facebook, you know, the, the, the foreign lads. But the really great blokes in it, you know. I, I, look how the, I look how the club was then and the team we have then, and, it, you know, it breaks my heart to see the, the position they're in now. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let's just go back to the house, because I didn't know this. So there's yeah. three of you in a house in Colic. If you looked out the back of your house, you'd see the big woods overlooking the race course. Yeah. yeah. That was my garden. Oh, I grew up on top of there, played yeah. there, yeah, and not used to go pre I don't know whether you did when you were there. That always used to be a pre-season training staple. You used to go oh, cross-country nice. through the woods and everything. Yeah. No flat piece in Colic Woods. So... <laughs> So who, who, who was who was the chef who did the cooking? I mean, what was it like? Listen, the three of you. We had, we had to, we got we got from training. We did a TBI because John O liked his cake. You see, and they did a chocolate fudge cake there. So we did a TBI for uh, after training with a bit of chocolate fudge cake. Then we get back and then we go out and we we do. I don't know. I always remember we drove up to Meadowhall one time because we all like steak. And they did um, there was a Greek restaurant in Meadowhall and they did this steak challenge. And the steak was three pound. It was three pound a steak. And if you could eat the starter and the steak and, and uh, I don't know, I think it was a bowl of ice cream in an hour, everyone ate for three. Now, I don't know whether you've tried eating three pounds of steak. I think a lion had struggled somewhere in Leggings. 
God, we had it down our trousers, up our jumper, and they're trying to hide it. But yeah, we used to we used to go all over. But I just remember me and John are lying down because Leggy was the only one that had a car then as well. Me and John are lying down in Leggy's car and Leg let Leggy driving with a stomach ache. But oh, we got up we got up to a million things like that down the years, us from. So this was kind of a forerunner of man versus food, was it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've gone up there with all the bravado, and we've all had nothing to eat, thinking, oh, that's a bit... Your stomach actually shrinks when when you have nothing to eat. So we've had three of these steak challenges, thinking one of us is going to do it, and we're all going to eat for free. And we all all ended up paying top dollar for it, but it was brilliant, mate. Yeah, had had some really, really good times. And the social side of it at that time as well, we all, you know... Most of us used to go out and have a beer together and socialise together in, in, in the same places. So, real, real good place to be. What about sort of, um, I don't know, fashion? Who, who, who were the cool dudes in, uh, in the squad then? Who, who was, what, what was it like? Yeah. And punters like to know all behind the scenes. You know, they see you on a Saturday afternoon, but what was it like? Yeah, when, when I first went there, Kev, Kev Bartley. Kev Bartley was always, was always quite smooth, you know, and, and well-dressed. Um, me old pal Jono, I'd have to say, was the worst. Was the worst, probably the best dancer, but the worst dressed. I remember him turning up one time to a game, and I think it was like a brown suit jacket and blue trousers or, or something like that. But yeah, I mean, uh, listen, we we never had any money to buy top suits and that then, so it was it, it was wear what you can. But I don't remember any that really stand out as being outstanding dressers, because a lot of the time as well, we were in these. You've got the match winner top on, haven't you? We were in the match winner shell suits that looked like something out of. Harry Enfield, to be honest with you. Hey, not just any shirt. I don't, I don't think you'd have worn this number. Hang on. Yeah, I did the barcode one. Yeah. I did. No, I never wore that number. I wore so that, that shirt, would have been though. Lundy. Sorry, that would have been Lundy. Yeah, I, I wore that shirt. I'm pretty sure I wore the, the one behind you and definitely the purple one so yeah. over your left shoulder. Definitely, I, I, and the, the famous Titan one as well, I wore that. I've got a picture of mis, myself in that one, the Titan shirt. I've got one of them on order because a lot yeah. of these, you know, they're really hard to get hold of. So this was actually yeah, Lundy's shirt, the nine, and that one there is um, Sean Murphy's Anglo Italian. Oh one. well, yeah. well, the Holmes Bitter one. That was yeah. the one that I made. My, that was the one that I made my debut, and that was that was the first division kit. Yeah, that's right. It was. Do, do you keep any? Do you still have any original not shirts or? I haven't, you know, because I was never one for keeping shirts, and I hated changing shirts with players because they were the enemy. Uh, and I didn't want anything to do with them. So I didn't want, I certainly didn't want to change shirts with them. But what I tended to do at the end of each season, you know, you get people, can you donate something for, you know, presentations or charities? And, and, and I gave away probably 90% of my shirts. I haven't got any nut shirts. I've got a couple of blues ones, a couple of Sheffield ones, Watford ones. But I wish I'd have kept some of the nuts. Well, like I say, the tartan one, the purple one, obviously the first one I wore, the Holmes Bitter one. I, you know, I wish I'd have kept them there down the years to, to show my kids. It's very interesting you talk about um, shirts and not swapping them because the current trend is you all make, you know, sometimes now players agree to swap shirts before a ball's yeah. kicked, don't they? Um, yeah. So very driven by you. Uh, I think I read somewhere, did you, the only one you ever asked for was Zola's. Was that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we played, it was the first year that I got promoted to the Premiership with Birmingham and we played down at um, Stamford Bridge. I think we were three 0 down after 15, 20 minutes, and uh, Zola had scored one and he'd set up good chance. And he was just probably the best performance I'd ever seen on a football pitch. And uh, you know, I was just amazed how good he was, Zola. And I remember standing next to him at a corner because obviously he's a similar height to me, so I marked him off a corner. And it was the only time I'd ever done it in my life. And I said, Franco, any chance of your shirt after the game? Yeah, 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 no problem. Anyway, this was only about half hour into the game. Changing room, he's got mobbed after the game. Thought nothing more of it. Getting changed, getting ready, and their kick man came down. He says, "Franco sent you that," and he and he gave he, he gave me shirt. And it, but I ended up with good pals with Kevin Hitchcock, who was at Chelsea with Zola, big pals of, of Zola's, and he was goalkeeping coach at Watford. So I ended up having a couple of conversations with with, with Zola down the years, and he sent me his last ever Cagliari top, all signed, and, and you know, obviously he had a little spell at at Birmingham as manager as well, as well. You know, I still do club ambassador stuff for Blues. Top, top, top person. And, uh, and I tell you what, if, if you never saw him play, you know, any, any youngsters out there, go on YouTube and, and just have a look how good he was, Gianfranco Zola. 
you, you write about him. What, what a, a great ambassador and a great bloke. I remember Leicester, we played them a few times and you'd be down in the dressing room after the game and uh, Zola was just different class, in, you know, yeah. shaking hands with everyone. And he waited outside the Leicester dressing room for about 10 minutes because he'd always wanted to meet Martin O'Neill and he'd spoke to me and oh, uh, I said, look, I could give it five. And he said, okay, I'll, I'll wait, I'll wait. And uh, Martin come out and said, I just want to introduce myself. I have to say, thank you for winning the League Cup. You know, it's like two weeks earlier. You did very well. You must be very proud of your team. And Martin's like very articulate, very, very intelligent man. Not many like Martin. And he just uh, he said, unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. really, really yeah. top, top draw. As, by the way, was Viali. Yeah. Viali was a real top guy too. Top guy. Yeah, I mean, I obviously played against him, didn't come across him, but... Like I said, I've, I've had a few conversations with Frank. He actually, I, I can't tell the story because there's too much swearing <laughs> involved. But Kevin Hicks got, got him to ring me up from Italy once and wind me up, and I, I didn't know who it was. But top, top fella, top fella. So, of all the people you come across, think primarily with your days with um, uh, with Knotts. You, yeah. you, you're a tough guy. Who, who was who was the hardest you came up against? Who was the toughest? Who was the most awkward? Who you know who get you a bit riled? Uh, oh, Stuart Pearce. Stuart Pearce was really tough. You know, I mean, I think if you if you're talking about fullbacks, they don't come any any tougher than him. Always remember, funnily enough, I think he played for Leicester and Man City. Danny Tiato, yes, Australian. You know, yeah, yeah, little, he was. It was mad because at the time uh, Australia had him one fullback and Kevin Muscat, who was horrible as well, with two fullbacks. But um, no, Tiato was always tough. You know, real. Um, Aggressive, and, and I tell you the one that, that, that always used to give me a hard time, and I've since ended up, you know, pals of his, and he played for Tranmere and Wolves. Andy Thompson, and he had about four oh, foot yeah. six, four foot seven, fullback, but really strong, really quick, really aggressive. And uh, <clears throat> I've ended up pally with Tom and play golf with him very rarely. I haven't seen him for a while now, but you know, that's, uh, that, you know, those three spring to mind. I mean, none of, I wouldn't say I was frightened of any of them, but I knew. Bloody hell, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an hard game today. It's going to be a tough game and the, the shin pads are going to get tested today. Talk to me uh, a little bit about that whole um, mentality, non-league to professional ranks. Yeah. Because clearly it's very, very challenging times for Notts, arguably as yeah. low as they've ever been in terms of now playing outside the Football League. Um, I think an awful lot of people expected... Um, uh, the history of Notts County uh, yeah. against Harrogate, players on more money, players having played hundreds of league games, yeah. players having played at Wembley, then really you should you should automatically beat Harrogate. Now, I know we know it's not like that, but what, what what's that dyna dynamic like, do you think, mm -hmm. between those players that sort of... Um, uh, uh, Inverted commas, non-league to the to the bigger the bigger clubs and players. How, how, how big is the gulf? What's the difference in mentality? What, what how do you see it? Um, well, well, don't forget every time every time a team in that league plays nuts now. It's I know it's a cliche, but it's a cup final. Everybody, somebody gets to Meadow Lane. I mean, there won't be another ground as as good as that in the league. I wouldn't have thought. And like you say, they're looking at players that have played extensively and majority of their career in the football league. I can only tell you from my point of view, whenever you played, I remember playing for Stafford in the, I think it was the the, the, the third round of the FA Cup and we drew Burnley. And you, you, want to, you want to do that bit better because you're playing a league team, you're playing league players and you want to impress them, you want to show them you're better, you want to be where they are, you want to show them that you're better. So, yeah, you know, it's a more, and you know, that league, I would imagine every team in that league is, is full time now. I wouldn't mm. imagine there's many that, that are part time. When I was playing at, in that league, we used to train Tuesday, Thursdays, and, and play Saturdays. There was one or two Barnet were full time, I think, and all Tringham and teams like that. But it was a really, really hard league. So you're probably talking, you know, any team in that league on any given day could probably be any team in the second division on any given day. So I think football wise, level wise, you know, it's not there's not going to be a massive, massive golf there because they're all. They're all going to be full-time players, and 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 all those players at Harrogate and, and teams like that, they want to be where Nuts and their players have been for the last however many years. So it's going to be difficult. It's going to be really, really difficult. You know, I, I didn't expect them to drop down and walk the league by any any. You know, I've played at I've played at nearly every level of non-league and professional football. So I, I knew it was never going to be easy for them drop down, walk away with the division, and go back up. It's just it's just a shame that they've got so 
So I'm near yeah, and just 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 fell at the final hurdle. What, what, generically, what, what what does a team at that level need to do to get over the finishing line? I think if you've got someone that can get you 30 goals, 30, you know, a real, real prolific goal scorer. Goal scorers are always the difference. If you've got someone, we, we had it in, in my spell there with Gary McSweegan. Gary McSweegan could turn not even a half chance, a quarter chance into a goal. Um, although Gary was very curtailed with injuries, mm. you know, if he could have guaranteed you 40 games a season, he'd have guaranteed you 20 goals. And I think if you've got someone with that, that, that bit of quality, that you know 25 to 30 goals, ultimately you got your goals are going to win you the games and get you over the line. But we all know the players that do that are the, most, are the hardest thing and the most expensive thing in the game. Yeah, I remember Gary, and I'm in touch with him a little bit because he's, he's based in Glasgow now, isn't he? And um, he always had that kind of like low centre of gravity, didn't he? And it was real like stocky legs, very powerful hamstrings. But his ability, his balance and his ability to hold people off and swivel and turn. And, yeah. You know. Well, yeah, I mean, Swigs was probably about an inch, an inch or two taller than me. But his, his arse and his thighs, <laughs> they were like, they were like that. And yeah, look, you couldn't knock him off the ball. Yeah. And, and what he did do, he was a really good striker of the ball. He, always, he never used mm. to scuff anything, always struck it clean with the laces. And because he had such big, powerful hamstrings and thighs, he only needed very short back lift. So <clears throat> he'd have a little touch and he wouldn't need a lot of room and he'd get his shot away and he could, he could hit it like a rocket. And, I, you know, I, I played with some good forwards down the years, but on his day, he, he was as good a finisher that I, that I played with Swigs. So... You actually spent quite a long time at Knotts, one of your longest stints, wasn't it? Um, it all came to an end. I suppose it was a bittersweet moment for you because you did get your dream move to the club you supported as a boy because, you know, you're a blue nose, aren't you? You're a proper blue yeah. nose and that, that to Nottingham people means a Birmingham City fan. Yeah, so yeah. I, I guess it was, you know, it was probably the perfect move for you from Knotts, wasn't it? Yeah, it, it was ever so strange because, um, like I say, John, I had gone a few months before and obviously John, I was... My, my big pal along with Leggy and uh, Leggy wasn't in the team at the time I remember it was Colin Murphy and Steve Thompson uh, were, you know, I got, got on great with Tomo played again for Tomo at Sheffield United and still speak to him and um, they'd just come for me I mean the, like I say the club the, the team was getting broken up then the drapes had gone John had gone so uh, uh, you know it, 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 it was a shame and um, he came to me and he said listen Blues are interested but the, the funny thing was one of my non-league clubs, not Stafford, it was a team I came to Stafford Armitage, they had a salon. So the reason why a joint deal was done is because then I could be valued at that and Leggy could be valued at that, so they'd only have to pay 40% of, of X amount. So Leggy wasn't in the team and Barry Fry had come down to sit and watch a reserve game with Tomo. This is what I've been told. And uh, he saw Leggy and he saw the throw-ins and Leggy getting crosses in and all that. So oh, we'll take him as well, he'll do for big Kevin Francis, get it on the end of big Kev. So we both went in a deal and we were both classed as, well, the, the, the combined deal was 400 grand, I think. But I think Leggy was valued at three or 400 grand and I was valued at 100 grand. So we both ended up signing, leaving on the same day and signing on the same day. Hey, good old Derek, he knew a trick or two, didn't he? Yeah, I think there was actually some sort of investigation into it, but it was all, <laughs> you know, it was all, I mean, it was nothing to do with me. I, I had no saying it. So it, Instead of paying 40% of 500 grand, it was 40% of 100 grand. So, oh yeah, Derek, uh, you knew how to do a deal. But um, yeah, it was a shame, obviously, from a non-league club. But it was, it was nothing to do with that. And ultimately, nobody did uh, anything, you know, wrong. wrong. Mor morally, you could question it, I dare say. But, you know, I don't think anything ever came of it. One thing we always ask um, is, um, during your time at Knotts, pick your five-a-side team. You can't pick yourself. So who will be your best five-a-side team? Right, well, I'll go with um, Steve Cherry in goal, Charlie Palmer, uh, Michael Johnson, Mark Draper, Gary McSweegan. That's good five-a-side. Good five-a-side. Yeah. And, and, you know, a real big pals and a big admirer, Tony Garner as well. I mean, Tony... You know, he'll admit he didn't score as many goals as he, as he liked for the club. But Tony was Tony was brilliant to have in the team. Strong as an ox, great professional. You know, Phil Turner, real good, real good captain. So, you know, you almost feel a little bit. It's unfair that you leave some some yeah. players out of that team because you know there was some quality in those times. 
But you'd be delighted to know John O'Let put you in his team, apparently, because he wouldn't have wanted to play against you. So no, well, he, 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 knows, he knows when I watch it, if he'd have left me out, I'd have been on the phone to him moaning. So, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd have to put... I, I, I bet you John I'll put Charlie Palmer in, didn't I? I, I think he did. Had. Yeah, I think who, he did. Do you remember who John O's was? I don't think he had McSweegan in. I'm trying to think who he had up front. With Dave Regis, Gary Lund, Kevin Bartlett. I think he had Lundy. You've got yeah, me on the hop there. I think, I think, yeah. I think, he, I think he had Lundy there. I think L- he... Lundy was a great player, and I always remember in later life he went on to be an estate agent, didn't he, Lundy? Uh, he, he, he was sells... always quite... Yeah. yeah, he was always yeah. quite academic, Lundy, not like the rest of us. <laughs> hey, if you're if you're ever looking to buy a house in Nottingham, Lundy will yeah. be selling it to you. I can assure you. Oh, um, oh, yeah, because oh, he, he used to go oh, to the bank or something. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Drapes tells the story when you when you guys were all off wherever, got on the um, on the on the on the state challenges at Meadowall. Lundy went into the local bank, didn't he, to to, to get in, um, some preparation for his business career. Yeah, he was. He was. I think I did have a house off him. I think I did have a house off him in the last contract I signed. In fact, I'm, I'm sure I did because I remember the picture of him with the keys. But yeah, I always remember towards the end of his career, he got into the uh, estate agency. But you always knew he, he was academic. He was a thinker, Lundy. You know, he was. He, he was a clever blog. Was it important then? Do you think as well that you know you, you moved into the area because a lot of players don't necessarily live locally now, do you? you? Know so I've just got this you know vision of the three of you in your like two up two down in Colic, but <laughs> that, but you you specifically mentioned, didn't you, the camaraderie and the team spirit yeah. that that helped engender? Yeah, I mean I, I was lucky because even even on the occasions that I didn't live in Nottingham, um, Birmingham, fifty minutes an hour. But yeah, it was important. And I always remember and I always tell this story. I mean, after you'd play a game at Knott's, uh, you'd go in the players' bar, seven half seven, all, all the team would still be there, you know, having a having a beer, so having a laugh, or you know, families and all that in there. And I remember coming towards the end of my career at Watford, talking to I was there with Sean Dyche and Big Malcolm McCoy and that. You'd go in the players bar half hour after the game, there'd only be two or three of you. So that that's that side of it. That camaraderie and that togetherness, I found as as time went on, that sort of drifted out the game a little bit. But the, we, we we had a brilliant team for that at nights. We you know we all like to be here. We all like going out. We all like socialising. And I'm you know I'm I'm still convinced that the better teams that I played in down the years, that side of it was good as well. We, we you know majority of us got on and majority socialised together. But it was brilliant. I mean Nottingham as well. It was. I don't know what it's like now, but it was a brilliant town at, at that time. A great place to be as a as a young young kid, a young footballer. It was, you know, I couldn't have thought, thought of anywhere better. Uh, one player we've not mentioned. I'm not sure whether he would have been a crossover. Would, would Sean Derry have been there when you were there? Yeah, Desa was my boot boy. Desa was nice. one of my first boot boys, and then I played with him again at um, at Sheffield United. But yeah, character, big character, Desa. Uh, got on great with him and. You know, went on to have an absolutely fantastic career and played for some played for some great clubs. But yeah, he was he might have been my first boot boy, I think. I can't remember. Was he any good? He definitely was at some definitely was at some <laughs> stage. But yeah, get on great with Daisy and speak to him now and again. Because he he I guess like you with Birmingham, he would be one of that rare breed really who grew up supporting, you know, their local team. Uh, and then get to play for them because his dad, his family are all massive Knots fans, you know, massive Knots fans. Yeah, I mean, and, and it's a shame because you don't send, you don't tend to see it a lot down the years. And I think it, I think it does make a difference, you know, if you're, if you're a homegrown player and you're playing for your home team. I think it does make a difference a to yourself and b to the fans. You know, uh, our old man's from from Glasgow, big Celtic. I was always brought up Birmingham Celtic and Celtic going to Celtic games, all that. And they always tell the story of, you know, Celtic won the European Cup in 1967 with 11 players, all from within 30 miles of the ground. Now, I don't think you'll ever, ever see that ever again. So I think it does, it, you know, players try and say it doesn't make a difference. But oh, it made a difference when I signed for Blues and I was a Blues fan and hometown club. So I think, you know, it's great to see one of your own putting that strip on, putting the collars on. And going out and, and, you know, especially with them doing well. Now, talking of Glasgow, um, one of Knott's, time, Knott's all-time greatest people uh, has to be Jimmy Cyril, East End yeah. Glaswegian. And 
I believe uh, that he spotted you or during his time at Derby, he would have been responsible yeah. for noticing you? Yeah, I, I went on trial to Derby a couple of times down the years. It was, it was Dave Manship was the scout who, who worked for Jimmy. And I just remember going and playing in, funny enough, it was a Derby re reserves against Forest reserves at Forest. And for such a little bloke, he had the loudest voice. And he was up the back of one of the just shouting and bellowing, you know. So yeah, I came across the uh, chief skater probably. I think Arthur Cox was the man. Obviously, nothing happened for me at Derby, and then he, he ended up coming back to Nuts uh, later on in life. Ended up getting pally with my dad because he heard the accent and he got talking to him. And my dad being a Celtic fan and, and Jimmy being an ex-Celtic player, but my dad used to say it's comical. We see he, he talked to my dad about players from the twenties and thirties as if my dad could remember them. You know, my dad's here was 60s and 70s, but yeah, massive character and, uh, you know, probably one of the most respected men in the game of the, of the last 50, 60 years. We've spoken about one or two highlight games. We've spoken about the League Cup victory over Tottenham, the two Anglo-Italian Wembley matches. Any other particular games um, that stick in your memory for Knox or any, you know, abiding memories? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like I mentioned, the, the derby game at the baseball ground where we, we just missed out in the playoffs. I mean, that was, that was heartbreak, and I still still speak to lads about that that day. On on a, on a personal note, I remember playing Sunderland at Meadow Lane, and I, and I can't find any footage of the goals. We beat Sunderland three two, and I scored two goals, but one at either end, but both runs and shots from about twenty five yards, and all the old end of season videos and all that. I've lost them, so I've, I've tried frantically to get to get footage of them on Twitter or something so I can show them more. Because I haven't got many of my nuts goals on tape. And, you know, I'd, I'd love those two goals. And I remember, you know, I have got footage of this goal. We, when we played South End in the semi-final for the Anglo and I, I scored the goal uh, that got us to the uh, penalty shootout competition and obviously winning the shootout competition. So, yeah, got games like scoring my first goal away at Grimsby. Uh, first goal in, in the first team. I remember it being one of the coldest times ever. You know, at that time, we used to show highlights of the game on a, on a Saturday, two time or Sunday, and the pitch was green, white, green, white. You know, it just in about a little three minute spell. And I remember playing the whole 90 minutes and not having one bead of sweat on me. It was that cold. So, yeah, that debut game, debut, you know, top flight, full medal line um, against Kenny Sampson. But I think if I had to pick one out, it'd be, it'd be the Derby day when we beat Forrest and Charlie scored. That was, you know, just a, a, an unbelievable atmosphere, you know, for Charlie to get the goal as well. I don't know how many goals Charlie scored in his career, but you could probably count them on one hand. And I've still got a great picture to this day. Somebody took it behind the goal of me. But I could run. I was quite quick. And it was like trying to catch Usain Bolt that day, chasing after Charlie. So, yeah, you know, there's, there's a few games that spring to mind. But I think I think the Forest game where we beat Forest was, was a brilliant... You know, when I, on the other occasion, when I do get over to Nuts now, I, I speak to fans on Twitter or Facebook. They, they all remember. Uh, fans have now christened it um, Sir Charlie Palmer Day. Um, I, I, I'm guessing you would have loved yeah. that atmosphere, you know, and I bet the tackles were flying in, weren't they? Yeah, it was brilliant. You know, we didn't we didn't get to see Meadow Lane absolutely rammed full on many occasions. You know, pr probably that game, Spurs game. You know, maybe a couple of the Derby games or whatever. But yeah, it was great. I, I, I was fortunate. I played in played in Nottingham Derbies, Sheffield Derbies, Birmingham Derbies. It's a great game to play. And again, you know, managers and players wheel off the old cliche it's another three points. But you know, it isn't. You're playing against your nearest rivals. Your fans want bragging rights for the week. And, you know, we, we'd lived in their shadow for, I don't know how long. Massive, massive underdogs that day. You know, they had a good team at the time, Forrest. And, uh, and for us to get the win was, was, was absolutely brilliant. And like I say, Charlie's celebration will, will live, live forever, won't it? So tell me now, what, what are you doing with yourself now? You've got your own soccer coaching schools, yeah? Yeah, I've been I've been doing kids coaching for well, I've been involved with it for twenty years. So I go around to four or five different venues in the Midlands and I, and I coach kids football from taking from the age of four up to up to fourteen. Just general skills and practicing and you know training each week. And I do a bit of personal training uh, in, in a gym in Sutton Coldfield where I 
I'll take people one to one, do a bit of fitness and weight stuff. So still very much involved in the fitness side of it. Still play a lot of veterans football. Um, play with Lee Carsley. You know, I had seen the other last year. I had Darren Ballfield, Lee Hendry. So there's still a lot of lot of old players out there still playing. Play a lot for the uh, Birmingham City All Stars team as well. So still love having a game of football. Love it dearly. The, the legs don't move quite as quick as they they once used to, um, which is unfortunate. But yeah, still still heavily involved in in, in fitness and and still love my football. Have you cut down on the yellow and red cards now? I did get sent off last season, but that's that's <laughs> the first time. And I'm I was I'm 48 now, so it it, it doesn't happen very often. I, I still get the odd. Uh, the odd flashback now and again and the red mist descends, but no, 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 you know, it's it's a great great league, the over 34s. I think two or three years ago, there was, the, the players I just mentioned, Stillian Petrov had a team in it, Dave Boost was playing in it. So over this way, the over 35 standard has, has been really, really good for the last four or five years. Fortunate parties now, I can play over 35s as well. As I'll be 34, so uh, you know, I know there's not too many more moles left on the clock, and I want to play as long as I possibly can. Thank you very much indeed. Really enjoyed the chat down memory lane. Um, love to see you over at Meadow Lane anytime. I think you came over with Steve Cherry, didn't you? Uh, not too long ago, and let's let's yeah. give you a bit of a tour around. So, Thank you're always you. most welcome um, at Meadow Lane. Shame it's not football league football at the minute, but hopefully, in the not too in, in the not too distant future it will be so paul thank you very much for joining us my pleasure all the best